Back in 2022, shortly after the invasion of Ukraine, many of the world's biggest economies introduced sanctions that were meant not to just hamstring, but to cripple Russia. Two years on, well, clearly that hasn't happened. Indeed, Russia's economy is growing at a rate that puts much of the world to shame. And even more galling than that, it seems that many goods barred from export to Vladimir Putin's regime are in fact ending up on Russian soil through third-party countries. The latest of these, British luxury cars worth hundreds of millions of pounds. I'm Neil Patterson, and on this edition of the Sky News Daily, we'll be asking how and why this keeps being allowed to happen. Well, the journalist who's done a huge amount of the digging on this story is our very own economics and data editor, Ed Conway, and he is back in the studio. Ed, good to see you again. See you. Um, be- before we get into the nitty gritty, just just explain exactly what the the, the state of the sanctions are uh, as as regards Russia. I mean, it's not it's not a complete ban when it comes to cars as it is when it comes to other things. There's sanctions. When we talk about sanctions, actually, it's a whole range of different things. You've got kind of some rules about what's going on with holdings of government debt that Russia has. That's one bit of it. Then you've got kind of sanctions on individuals, mm-hmm. so particular, particularly oligarchs and various other people. We've read a lot about that. So that's individuals. And then you've got sanctions on the kinds of goods you are no longer allowed to send to Russia. And you've got military There's, within that. We're not, we're, not selling, we're not selling guns to Russia. No, we're not, we're, we're, we really shouldn't be selling guns to Russia. And indeed, you shouldn't also be selling what are known as dual-use goods. And that could be even something as simple as, as a fridge or a piece of machinery mm-hmm. that could then be repurposed. You could take the microchip or you could take some of the steel uh, and potentially turn that into to weaponry. And, and, and okay. indeed, we know that has been happening. So mm-hmm. we know that there have been uh, weapons, drones that have turned up with little bits of uh, stuff that has been imported in the guide of something else. However, on top of all of that, there's also rules because everyone in the UK knows that people, wealthy Russians, like luxury yeah. items. Those Russian boys like their toys. And and we in the UK produce quite a lot of luxury goods, whether it's you know consumer goods uh, or indeed automotives. Uh, so there's a specific set of rules that says you can't send luxury things uh, to, to Russia. And in the case of cars, you can't send any car that's worth more than £42,000 to Russia. That is strictly against the rules. That is technically illegal. I'm in a bit of a confused state, not for the first time, Ed, because, you know, Russia, massive marketplace. So presumably those high-end car manufacturers here in the UK would have a big hole in their mm. finances as a result of mm-hmm. this. Funnily enough, though, I was just noticing a tweet from the Minister of State for Trade, Greg Hans, saying, did you know eight out of ten cars produced in the UK are exported <laughs> to more than 130 markets? To which you've replied, yes, I did. And yes. Azerbaijan is coming up. This is an interesting one. Well, it just so happens that, that I have been looking at the database <laughs> for a long time. And the interesting thing is, you know, when you look at the database, HM Revenue and Customs, the, the customs bit of the name, they are duty bound for anything that leaves our shores mm. uh, or indeed comes in to get the customs details on it. And then we can then look at the aggregated statistics and see precisely what's coming in and going mm. out. So you can see how many cars we're sending to, uh, to Russia. You can see how many cars we're sending elsewhere. And if you look at the official data, the sanctions looked like they've been a tremendous success mm. because our exports to Russia, which were maybe kind of 300 million or so in the couple of years before the invasion of Ukraine, they've just gone to zero. Yeah. And so, like you say, you might have thought, oh, there's a big hole that's left in the revenue from the UK car export industry as a result of that. So that has disappeared. But at the very same time, mysteriously, well, maybe not mysteriously, even as Russia's ex- exports to Russia fell from 300 million or so to zero, exports to Azerbaijan, a neighbour of Russia, Mm -hmm. an economy which is about the same size as Ghana, 10 million people. There is no great economic boom there. And yet we have seen exports of UK cars, luxury cars, going up from basically zero, a few million, Mm -hmm. to 270 million in 2023. My, my spidey sense is tingling here, Ed. Something's amiss. Azerbaijan as a, as a, a, a new 100, 200, 300 million pound market for this stuff just immediately after Russia ceases to be one. And it's almost almost mirrors exactly the fall in Russia's car imports have suddenly gone uh, to, to Azerbaijan. And if you look at the same, by the same token, obviously Azerbaijan, former Soviet state, neighbour, friendly uh, to the Putin regime. Anecdotally, we know that lots of goods are going via Azerbaijan into Russia. We know the same thing of Georgia, we know the same thing of Kyrgyzstan mm-hmm. and a few other places, Armenia as well. Yeah, but you know me, Ed, I need more than anecdote. However, yeah, there is data as well as anecdote in this case because if you look at the chart of 
car exports from Azerbaijan into Russia. So we're talking previously about car exports coming from Britain into Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan. Look at car exports from Azerbaijan into Russia. It's the same shape. The line is exactly the same. It's basically zero. And then suddenly it goes through the roof. And put all of this together. And it doesn't take an expert mm. to divine what might be going on there. The problem, though, Neil, is that, you know, these these are trade statistics. We know what the consignment says, where it says it's going to. But once they've left British ports, and particularly once they get into Azerbaijan or somewhere where the mm -hmm. surveillance isn't especially good, you just don't know for sure where that consignment has ended up. And this is, I guess, the broader point. The problem with trying to impose sanctions is that invariably, you may say, don't send your goods to a particular country, mm -hmm. but invariably, there'll be some other third country, as it's sometimes known, that you might be able to send it to, and mysteriously, they may send it on. And that is not breaking... The law, as long as you, as far as you're concerned, they go to Azerbaijan and you don't want to think about it, then you are kind of in tune with the sanctions legislation as it currently stands. So we're joining the dots a little bit here. Something that might reassure some people is if we look, look to other countries, you know, for example, Germany, well known as well for, for high end motor manufacture. Are we seeing similar there? Yeah, it's exactly the same thing is happening with German cars, except rather than going via Azerbaijan, they seem to be going more via Kazakhstan and mm -hmm. Kyrgyzstan. What's really striking about the UK story in this case, however, is that because the, we get the data in terms of the number of cars and also yeah. the value of the total, you can work out from there, justify one by the other, what the average value of each car going into Azerbaijan is. Go okay? on. So you remember before I said there is a rule saying don't sell anything worth more than £42,000 mm. to Russia. Okay? Otherwise, you're definitely breaking, if not one, then, then a few of these different sanctions. The average value of the cars going to Azerbaijan is over a hundred thousand pounds. Wow! It's about one hundred and six thousand pounds on on on, on average. average yeah. On average. So this tiny country, which has never been a big recipient of UK cars, has suddenly not just become the sixteenth biggest destination for UK cars. So it's it's above Portugal. It's above Sweden. It's above it's above Austria. But on top of that, alongside Bahrain and Saudi Arabia, uh -huh. it is importing the highest value cars from one of the highest value car markets in the world, which is the UK, you know, home to all of these these car marks. So why should we be concerned about this? And I'm, I'm being slightly facetious here, but but it, it, it's not that Vladimir Putin is repurposing Chelsea tractors for the battlefield in Ukraine, no. is it? There, there are two things going on here. There is an economic war where the UK is trying to use every every kind of lever at its disposal to make it tough for Russia to, to do battle. But then on, by the same token, there is this other economic war where you know there are wealthy people in the country who like nice things and they are potentially part of that decision-making machine and you want to make life tough for them. That clearly, on the basis of what we're seeing in this data, is clearly not happening. It's not working. What are the manufacturers saying? Because presumably they will say, export licenses, perfectly prim and proper. Yeah. You know, we can't be held accountable for what happens after we sell them on to someone. They, they say, uh, as far as we know, we are not breaking sanctions. Uh -huh. There's a, a line from the SMMT, the, the, the motor lobby group, who say, well, trade flows to particular countries are volatile. Maybe, but I've never seen anything like this I, in I, the entire statistical history. I have a line from that from the, the SMMT. There is no available evidence to indicate a lack of compliance. No. Well, that, I mean, but technically it's that impossible. is true, but... It's impossible to get available evidence mm. that would indicate that if everyone is doing their job in this kind of slightly grey economy properly. These are quite big figures. I think that's the other thing to note. I, I mentioned previously it was about 300 million a year to, to Russia, albeit that that was kind of post-COVID, so that was a bit lower than usual, and you also had the post-Crimea kind of sanctions that were still imposed. Mm. These are big figures. And, and actually, the, I'll tell you how I noticed this. I was looking at our trade with Azerbaijan because I've been doing a bit of work on this in general. We, you know, we trade quite a bit with Azerbaijan. Mm. It's not a kind of trivial economy, but still pretty small but it just kind of went up mm. through the roof and I was just like well, what is that that's causing that and it's cars there we do not know there's nothing in this data that identifies which brands we're talking about except to say that it's very hard to find cars from certain brands which are worth more than 100 you know six thousand pounds and these on average are, are worth that much Ed uh, you take a breather for a moment when we come back we'll be asking what other goods are making their way to Russia and whether there's anything we can actually do about it Welcome back. Ed Conway is here talking us through the hundreds of millions of pounds worth of luxury British vehicles somehow inexplicably making their way over an export ban, around sanctions and 
into Russia. Ed, look, I will admit that I am still struggling a little bit. This grey market, this grey economy, call it what you want. I mean, is it truly entirely opaque? Is there just no way to know what happens to this stuff once we, well, once we sell it on? <sighs> It's, it's very difficult. Mm. One hallmark, and this is not really for cars, but it's for, for other things. It's for, you know, computer chips, pieces of electronics, mm. optics as well. So when people have been sifting through the battlefield, you know, seeing drones, artillery that has been used to try and kill Ukraine and sometimes successfully kill Ukrainian citizens, they've sometimes found microchips, for instance, that they can then identify have come from places in Europe. So there is a list as a result of those operations where people have been looking through the Russian kind of weaponry and seeing that they have been piecing it together from various different items that have come in potentially through the back door exactly like this, there's a list of here are the things you really shouldn't be sending to any of these kind of neighbouring Soviet, former Soviet countries which, which might be sending them on. But on that front, we know that those items have been sent in large numbers from the UK, from British companies to places like Kyrgyzstan, Armenia, Georgia as well. So we, we, we're finding ourselves in a situation where it isn't just luxury items. Give us some of the other stuff that has managed to find its way onto a Ukrainian battlefield via export to a Soviet satellite state and then to Russia and then to Ukraine. So we went through the list. As I say, all of this data is publicly available mm. on the HMRC kind of trade data website. And we went through that and looked at this list of different items that Europe and, and the UK say it's, do not send this stuff to mm -hmm. Russia or anywhere close to Russia. And we found that the main stuff on that list that the UK is still sending to places like Kyrgyzstan, to places in the Caucasus and Central Asia, is, here's the list, drone, plane and helicopter parts. We're sending millions of pounds worth of that. Data processing machines, telephone switching equipment. This is stuff that we know can be used by mm. the Russians to wage war. Yeah. Aeronautical navigation equipment, radio navigational aids. This is being sent from British factories to the neighbouring states around Russia. And we know this stuff has shown up uh, because it's been used as weaponry by Russia. Stuff manufactured in this country, stuff manufactured in the European Union, which we are banned from exporting to Russia, mm -hmm. has ended up in Ukraine and has ended up being used to kill Ukrainians. Correct. And we've seen you've seen the evidence from the battlefield and also you see you see the evidence of the flows of that stuff that goes into these neighbouring states. Once it goes in there, yes, you, you cannot say with 100% certainty that it ends up in Russia, mm -hmm. but it's very hard to think of another plausible explanation. I mean, Shouldn't, shouldn't others have realised this? And I think in two places, actually three places, one in central government, two in our intelligence services, and three the manufacturers themselves yeah. who haven't noticed, a, a, haven't noticed a dent in their profits. I think trying to confront this is incredibly difficult, OK? Because what, what can you do? Really, the only way that you can be absolutely sure this is not going to happen is to sanction... Azerbaijan that, to sanction Kyrgyzstan or to, or to impose what are known as, as secondary sanctions, which yeah. basically make it really difficult for anyone on that supply chain to, to, to engage. Let me don my tinfoil hat then just for a second. Is global trade or has globalism rendered sanctions ineffective? I mean, think about it this way. We, talk, we, were, we started our conversation talking about luxury cars. And as you have said, you know, once they go to a country with an export licence, we, we have no control over yeah. what happens They're to them. They're kind of laundered. Next. It's laundering. Like but money laundering, this is trade laundering. I can accept, you know, some Russian oligarch driving around in a swanky car once or twice, but we're also facilitating the, the replenishing of the Russian war effort through all these other things that you yeah. have identified as being, as being sent through these, these countries. It, it just strikes me that, you know, Rewind to 2022, and we were told that these sanctions would cripple the Russian economy. Did no. everyone in central government know the fact that this is the way around it? Ship it to another country and then import mm. it from there? I have no idea if they knew that, but certainly at the time, yes, they, we were being told that Russia was going to have this cataclysmic recession. In yeah. the same way that in the same way that Ukraine has had this kind of cataclysmic recession alongside all of the other stuff. Mm. But when you look... I don't know how much you can rely on any of these figures, but it doesn't look like Russia has had a crippling recession mm -hmm. in the same way that, that anything like Ukraine has had. And almost all of these goods have been able to find their way back in. Russian oil, which hitherto might have come out of Russia on a ship and gone to a UK refinery and then been refined into diesel and gasoline and kerosene for planes, that 
still leaves Russia, doesn't go to the UK anymore directly. It goes to a refinery in India, mm -hmm. where the Indians refine it into diesel and kerosene and gasoline, mm -hmm. and then it gets shipped to the UK. The same molecules of Russian gas and oil, in this case, come out of the ground in Russia. They still leave Russia quite successfully. And as you say, we are in this globalized world. It is always quite easy mm -hmm. to ship something via some other place, and it suddenly masquerades as something that came out of, of a different country. And that's happening with pretty much every good, not just going into Russia, but coming out of Russia as well. But the, more, the more you and I have talked about this, you know, with microphones in front of us and, and, and elsewhere, the, the more I just become of the view that sanctions don't work, that sanctions, as announced by... Boris Johnson, by you know those in America, mm -hmm. those elsewhere in the well, G7, you know they were they were designed to make political leaders feel better about themselves and domestic you know body the body politic to feel like their politicians were doing something. I think I, I say one one kind of pushback on that yeah. is there is one country, and I'm not like a, I'm not an expert on on sanctions, no. but there is as, as far as I can tell, you know there, there's one country that has been really quite successful at imposing sanctions, and that's America. Mm -hmm. Partly, well, I think primarily because when they impose sanctions, A, people listen because mm -hmm. this is the, the world's superpower. And B, they tend to do these secondary sanctions that mean that if you are anywhere down the supply chain, you're making a little thing that goes into the, the gadget. Mm -hmm. If that gadget eventually gets used for war, you can't do any trade with that company that's, that's kind of eventually selling it on. And those kind of sanctions are are really powerful. And they have been shown to be really, really powerful with Iran. So I think it is possible. Sanctions can work, but you need to be really decisive and aggressive about it. And I think the problem here is that, frankly, Europe, including the UK, have not been decisive and aggressive. And they have not gone out to Azerbaijan and said, look, I see some cars here that have come from the UK. There's striking pictures of the roads and the routes from Georgia, from the port in Georgia, through to the Russian border, which are just chock-a-block with truck after truck after truck taking stuff into Russia. This is a massive, massive phenomenon. The UK is part of it, but so is Europe. And this is before we even talk about the kind of legal trade between China and Russia, which has been booming. We've not looked at that data quite as much as we should be, I think. I feel like I, I, I regret not having done this sooner. And given we're in this year, which is potentially very decisive for, for Ukraine, given this is a part of the story of how Russia is doing pretty well at the moment. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be talking about it. I think you're right. Ed Comey, thanks very much. Thank you. In February 2022, then Prime Minister Boris Johnson told the Commons and the Kremlin that the sanctions he and other world leaders announced would bite, that he would, quote, continue on a remorseless mission to squeeze Russia from the global economy piece by piece, day by day and week by week. Yet, year after year, that just hasn't happened. Time and again, those sanctions have been circumvented and items manufactured in the West are being used by Russia to kill Ukrainians. Putin, well, he may be able to evade sanctions. The West cannot evade its promises, nor its responsibilities. That's your lot for this edition of the Sky News Daily. We'll see you next time.